Well, thank you for inviting me. Lori Robinson mentioned this work when she gave the opening address. She has been a tireless champion of this work, both encouraging the COPS office and other branches of the government to support this work, to develop this work. So I express my appreciation to her. I'm sure she has something wonderful she's going to do, but I regret she's retiring. My goal today is to lay out the basic idea of procedural justice and to talk about how I see that fitting into policies and practices that might be important. I particularly want to talk about community courts and drug courts as sites of this kind of approach. I acknowledge that Mike has already done a good job of laying the ground here, so I'll just try to amplify on his comments. When we think about the goal that we imagine for the justice system, first and foremost, that goal is to provide people with justice. In addition, however, there are other goals that are important. One is to make decisions that people are actually willing to accept and abide by. And another is to retain and enhance public trust and confidence so that people view the courts as essentially entitled to exercise authority. They come to them when they have problems and then related to that they accept the court's resolution of those problems. I think I don't need to say to the people in this room that the traditional adjudication model has problems achieving at least these latter objectives. There are two big literatures that have developed over the last 25 years, one on the general public and the high volume courts that the general public deals with, whether it's traffic court, family court, whatever, and then the more specialized courts that deal with more serious criminal felony type adjudication. In both cases, there's been a lot of difficulty with the court's ability to secure compliance with court directives, cooperation when the court sets up a rehabilitation program, for example, especially over time. And obviously there's a volumes written about lack of trust and confidence among the general public in the, the legal system. In the wake of these difficulties, many alternative kinds of courts have developed. Most of the courts that are listed here have been discussed in at least one of the panels at this meeting. They are all different in some ways, but also all very similar. Well, the question that I think I am best able to address for you is, how can we be helped in our effort to deal with adjudication and alternatives to adjudication by knowing how the public evaluates the courts? Both those members of the public who happen to be in a particular court going through some court procedure and the public more generally when it's asked to evaluate how the courts are managing our problems. Another way to put that is what do people want when they deal with the courts? What are they looking for? It's through research on that question that procedural justice has developed as an idea. Procedural justice in its basic formulation is, is fairly straightforward and not something that I imagine that anyone would really dispute. And that is that when people are dealing with some authority, like a, a judge or a mediator, they're not only concerned about the outcome, they're also concerned about how that person processes their problem, how they make decisions, how they treat them, and that this influences how they react to the outcome. What I think is a stronger statement that emerges from decades of research is that actually people focus more strongly on their perception that the authority they're dealing with is or is not managing their problem through fair procedures. This idea of procedural justice, I did or didn't get a fair process for my case, turns out to be more important in terms of people's willingness to accept the decisions that are made 
to abide by them, to continue abiding by them over time. It's more important in their evaluation of the judge, the courts, the law. And it also has a bigger, stronger impact on people's everyday compliance with the law. Three things that we definitely do care about. Now, I'll talk in more detail about procedural justice later, but just to give you a sense for what I'm talking about, when we do studies of people in court or mediation, we constantly find that these are the four key issues that are on their minds when they talk about being fairly or unfairly treated through the process of the disposition of their case. Two of the issues are about the quality of the decision making, voice, was I given an opportunity to present my evidence to state my case before decisions were made? Neutrality, did the decision maker make the decision based upon neutral principles, legal rules, not their own prejudices or biases? Quality of treatment, was I treated respectfully as a person? Were my rights as a citizen respected? And finally, trustworthiness. Do I believe that the decision maker sincerely tried to consider the needs and concerns of the different parties and do something that is best for those people? So four core elements, what people mean by a fair or an unfair procedure. But why should you be interested? As I've already mentioned, you should be interested because a large body of research now shows that procedural justice works in the sense that if people feel they get those elements of fair procedure, they're much more willing to accept decisions, they have much more positive views about the legal system. But I also think that the people in this room might be particularly interested because this body of research and the line of argument that's flowing from it is very supportive of what you're doing. That is, it supports building alternatives to adjudication, and it supports approaches that try to promote community involvement and try to focus more on what the community wants, how the community is experiencing legal procedures. Well, let me start with just one example showing that this argument that I'm making about procedural justice works. I'll use an example study from two cities in California, Oakland and Los Angeles, it's a study of the acceptance of decisions made by judges in courts. People could either have gone to court because they wanted help or they could have been required to come. And it's deliberately designed to identify and sample three major ethnic groups, whites, Hispanics, and African Americans. Well, if you think about someone who comes to court, you could have three images of what might matter to them based upon the experience that they end up having. One is the, the favorability of the outcome. During the mediation session this morning, it was pointed out that by the time people get to court, they're really interested in vindication. So they may be focused on whether they win or lose. Perfectly natural way to think of it. In fact, judges often say that when they make a decision, they make one friend and one enemy. And the idea is that if you win, you like the judge. If you lose, you don't like the judge. A little bit more nuanced way of looking at it is that people have a sense of what the fair outcome is or the right outcome. And so they're still interested in the outcome, but they are trying to think of it in terms of whether they get what they think they deserve. And then finally, there's this idea of procedural justice, that what people are really interested in is seeing that no matter what the outcome is, that the process through which their case is managed conforms to their sense of what's a fair way to make this decision and a fair way to run the hearing. Well, so here I think is the key empirical point. If we take those three ideas, I got a good or bad outcome, I got a fair or unfair outcome, the hearing or the adjudication was fair or unfair in its procedures, and we look at the weight that each of those judgments has in 
whether or not people say that they're willing to accept the decision. That is, I accept this decision, I'm going to abide by this decision, I'm not angry about it, I'm not going to resist it, I'm not going to appeal it, I'm going to follow it. So why would they say that? The most important issue by an enormous amount is whether they do or do not think that the hearing was conducted through fair procedures. Now, obviously, to some extent, people are more willing to accept outcomes that are more favorable, and we see that. But what's really striking is the degree to which those outcome judgments are not the key issue that are focused on, and that overwhelmingly, people in courtrooms are looking at their sense that the judge did or did not use a fair procedure. And since I know there are judges in the room, I'll also point out that how they feel about the judge is fundamentally linked to whether they think the judge used fair or unfair procedures and not to whether they think that the decision that was made was fair or favorable. Now, another point flowing from this same research in California and taking advantage of the multi ethnic nature of the sample, that this is true for each of the three primary groups that were studied. That is, we're obviously concerned about the feelings of the members of minority groups because we consistently find that trust and confidence in the courts and the law is much lower in the minority community. But if we ask the question, do the members of minority groups look for different things from their experiences in court? What's interesting is that the answer is no. That is, what is it that minority groups are really looking at when they're deciding whether to accept the decisions that they get when they go to court? They're looking at procedural justice. What is it that whites look at? Procedural justice. So we don't really need to try to think of a different strategy for addressing the concerns of different ethnic groups. In fact, the concerns of different ethnic groups are very similar. Now, it is true that minority group members are more likely to report that they were not treated fairly when they go to court, but the way that they think about that issue is exactly the same way that white litigants do. So there's one model fits all. The other similar point is, does it matter whether you come to court because you're bringing a problem to court, or you come to court basically because you're required to as a defendant? Again, those are different orientations towards the court, but they don't matter in terms of how people evaluate their experience in court. They're still primarily focused on the question did I or did I not receive fair procedures? So a general finding that goes across the different kinds of experiences that people are having in court, the different kinds of people who are in court. So, and I think, again, to emphasize a very strong finding in the sense that look at how much procedural justice judgments are overwhelming any other judgment. So if we're concerned about what people want, we have a very good message from this research. They want procedural justice, and we need to understand what that means and how it could be built into the design of the courts. Now, I don't want to overstate the case, so I'm going to give you a little bit more nuanced result from a study that was done by the state of California where they had a much bigger sample of people who were involved in different kinds of courts. And we can look at different kinds of courts and basically make the same comparison of whether people are looking at outcomes, fairness of decisions, or fairness of procedures when they evaluate the court's system. And what's important here is that, again, for many kinds of experience, and particularly the high volume kinds of experiences that the California courts were particularly concerned about, small claims in traffic court, family court, criminal court, the same finding, overwhelming procedural justice effect on people's trust and confidence in the courts. 
the one nuance when we're looking at civil courts, and these civil court cases were more about uh, commercial disputes where money was involved and issues of that type. Procedural justice is still important, but a fair outcome becomes more important. And then another interesting point to make is that attorneys were found to care about procedural justice, but to care more about outcomes relative to procedural justice. Certainly in a vast number of the cases that are likely to be of concern in a community court type situation, we're still seeing this dominance of procedural justice considerations. Now, in making this make sense, I think it's really important that I make clear that decision acceptance is not the same thing as happiness. I'm not saying, and the research does not say, that people are happy if they don't get what they want. They say, great, I'm great, I lost, you know, I won my case. I lost my case, you know. I, then in other words, they're not reacting emotionally based upon winning or losing so much as they are reacting to their understanding that people cannot always win, they cannot always get what they want, and that losing is more acceptable if you're losing through a fair procedure. So the procedural justice approach minimizes the idea of winning or losing and the idea of satisfaction or dissatisfaction with winning or losing. And it focuses on delivering gains that all parties can receive irrespective of their outcome. Someone to listen to them, to consider their story, to understand their concerns, to recognize their rights, acknowledge the importance of their needs. All of these things happen separate from the outcome. So that we're focusing on something that we can deliver to everyone and focusing away from winning or losing in a narrow sense. Now, I'll make a few further points about this to illustrate why I think this finding is important for those who are interested in the design of the courts. I'll talk about robustness. Simple procedures can have an impact. Even if you're delivering negative outcomes, you can build trust. You can gain an enduring acceptance over time. And this effect works with serious criminals. Well, first, that this is a robust effect. I've often had the experience of getting a lot of skepticism from decision makers when I present these ideas. And then I present all the data and people say, well, that's probably true, but it wouldn't actually matter if something important was at stake. So I think I want to tell you that we've made a number of efforts to try to find important things and see if people still cared about procedural justice when important things were at stake. We've looked at um, pretrial arbitration in commercial disputes in federal court where up to $20 million was at stake and found that the primary issue to people when they try to decide whether to accept pretrial mediation results is whether they think the hearing was fair, not the amount that they won or lost. We found enormous procedural justice effects in family court where there's tremendously important issues like child custody involved. And procedural justice has been found to be very important when we're making policies about contentious issues where people have ethical or moral values at stake. So it's a very robust effect. It's also clear that fairly simple changes in procedure can have an impact on the legitimacy of the court system on people's willingness to cooperate. I'll give just two really simple examples. First is of the police and second of the courts. There's a wonderful study that was done in Australia. In Australia, the police do many more random roadblocks, stopping people for uh, potential drunk driving. In this particular study, people were randomly assigned to receive a procedural justice message or the normal message, which I guess wasn't very procedurally just. This new enhanced procedural justice message was two to five minutes. It included the police officer 
explaining the purpose of the stop, the reason for the policy, asking for input from the person stopped if they had any advice about how the police could police the community, and showing respect for the motorist by saying something nice to them, like, what a nice clean car, or thank you for keeping your seatbelt on. In other words, trying to do something respectful in the context of this traffic stop. Two to five minutes, and it was found that afterwards a significant positive effect of legitimacy of the police, support for police in the community, and the willingness to go out and work with the police to police the community all went up. Similar study that uh, Kevin Burke, a judge in Hennepin County, did in the courts, where randomly assigned judges, when they're making a decision and delivering it, are told to just stop and spend three to five minutes explaining to the person what the decision is, why they made the decision, how it reflects legal rules, and how they are paying attention to the person's concerns, even if they can't give them what they want. Again, a very brief intervention, but higher satisfaction, and I think more important to us, higher acceptance of the decision. People didn't come back into court as much. So both an attitudinal and a behavioral effect. The third point, you can deliver justice while building legitimacy. Often people have the feeling that they can't accept this approach because their job is to do what's right. So let me give an example from a situation that has that characteristic. Imagine as you're going home from this meeting, you're stopped by the police and you get a ticket. So can you imagine that as the police officer is walking back to his car and you're holding the ticket in your hand, that you could have more respect for the police than you did an hour before? Well, that's what this study that I'll tell you about now does. It looks at people who are stopped by the police and receive a negative outcome. And it looks before and after. But it looks at the people who receive their negative outcome through a fair procedure. And what's interesting is that even though everyone in this study got a negative outcome, both trust and confidence in the police and the willingness to cooperate with the police to help fight crime increased significantly. So in other words, you can deliver a negative outcome if it's legally appropriate, but in a manner that simultaneously builds support for legal authority. Fourth point, decision acceptance over time. One of the things that we struggle with, obviously, with the courts is to get people to accept decisions not just at the moment, although that's one challenge, but over time, so that they're not back in court in two or three months. This is a study of re reintegrative shaming. It's randomly assigned people who went to a shaming conference or to a traditional adjudication. Those who had a restorative justice conference were more likely to say they got procedural justice because restorative justice conferences do produce perceived procedural justice. And because of that, they evaluated the law as more legitimate. But what was interesting is the study then looked to see if starting two years after that session, and for the two years after that, according to police records, the people who got a fair procedure, thought the law was legitimate, were less likely to reoffend by breaking that law. And what they found is that the rate of reoffense was about one-fifth as high among the group that viewed the law as legitimate as among the other group. So in other words, we're talking about years after one experience of going to court or having a restorative justice conference. And we see a tremendous effect on behavior as reported by the police. So these effects go over time. Mike mentioned some other experimental research on drug courts that also shows effects over time. And then I think I won't dwell on this because you already heard about this and Mike presented several really nice studies of drug court that show procedural justice effects. But I'll just make the point that 
research shows that across the arc of the criminal justice system, procedural justice is helpful. Procedural justice in prisons significantly reduces violence in those prisons. When people experience procedural justice upon reentry, it lowers the rate of recidivism. So even among a group of serious criminals, we're seeing big effects. One example, um, this is the Mears project that, that you just heard about. It's the ceasefire project. Basically, as Emily said, this is a reentry project. When people come back from prison, they've been in prison for violent crime that's related to gun use, they have a, a session with attorney generals and other police officials, but the session is designed around procedural justice in some of the same ways that we just heard about in the Australian case. Instead of being lectured to, the way I'm lecturing to you, the offenders sat around a table with the law enforcement officers. They talked about the desire for the offenders to do well and the interest of the community in helping them to do that. Tried to treat them with respect, tried to listen, give them voice, as opposed to merely saying, if you break the law, we'll catch you and put you back in prison, which is the traditional approach. And this project found a 40% reduction in violent crime among these offenders in the years after that. So that's just a two-hour meeting, and you're just changing the content of that meeting along the lines that we've been hearing about in some of these panels to emphasize concepts like we're working on this together, we care about your needs and concerns, we want to work with you and hear your side of the story, we are concerned about your well-being, we want you to do well. Those kind of messages have a tremendous impact. Okay, well so summarizing, the way members of the public perceive the courts and evaluate court practices shapes how they feel and what they do. But we can benefit from knowing very clearly what it is about court policies and practices that people really care about, and that is this idea of procedural justice. So the access to the courts that we see as so important to people is really access to what they want to be a fair procedure for managing their case. I would like to emphasize one consistent finding, and that is the quality of interpersonal treatment really matters. That is, from my experience dealing with legal professionals, particularly judges, judges are trained in the law. They understand the concept of neutral decision making, but judges are not necessarily trained in interpersonal relations. I think we had this discussion earlier today about making all the judges go back and get degrees in social work. And if they got those degrees, then they would realize that people also are concerned about interpersonal issues. And that's consistently what we find, that people react to whether they're treated with dignity and respect, whether they see that their rights are respected, whether they believe the authorities care about their needs and concerns, and whether they think that they're being listened to and having what they say considered by decision makers. So that's the second part of procedural justice. Now, how could we secure the gains of procedural justice? I think we can pretty straightforwardly talk about redesign of the court system. One thing that I think is very important is that ideally we would treat people's entire experience with the criminal justice system or with the courts, if they're civil courts, as one long experience where we would hope procedural justice would be important at all stages. We certainly know that there's a big impact of how the police treat people. These procedural justice findings are very important in studies of whether people resist the police or accept their decisions. When people get to the courts, they deal with bailiffs, they deal with staff, they deal with help desks, and we know that all of those experiences matter. People also deal with a judge or mediator, that matters. And then they deal with 
if they have corrections involved, they deal with corrections officials, and that matters. So we would ideally design a system where all of these different authorities cared about procedural justice. And so we would have a system level model. But what would we want that model to do? First, although issues like cost and delay matter, we consistently do not find that those are important issues that are driving people's reactions to their experience in court. Just the way winning or losing is not a key issue that's driving people's reactions. It's really the issue of justice, and whether justice is done. So let's focus on these four key issues that I talked about. This is an example from that study in California that I mentioned, just to show you that when people talk about fairly treated or unfairly treated, they're really considering four different issues at the same time. One is voice, neutrality, respect, and trustworthiness. And they're not paying much attention again to the outcome. So that's an important point from my perspective. People are pretty sophisticated. We consistently find that they distinguish these four different aspects of their experience, and they consider all of them distinctly when they're trying to decide if fairness has occurred. Well, voice is the first. People want an opportunity to tell their side of the story in their own words. This is fairly straightforward. I think that the case man management implications are also pretty straightforward. What we need is we need for people to have forums where they can tell their side of the story. This is one of the reasons that mediation is so popular. People feel that they can speak. And ironically, we actually find that criminal defendants rate plea bargaining as a fairer procedure than a trial, because they say that in plea bargaining, they're actually asked what they think should happen. They get to talk about what they would think the right sentence would be, so they get voice. Neutrality, people come to the courts because they respect judges as neutral, principled decision makers. And I think an important point that I would make is that they're usually right, that judges usually are making their decisions in neutral, principled ways, but they often don't provide the information that allows people to actually know that. That is, it's not enough to just be doing that. It's also important that people understand that you're doing that. And that's why giving people information is so important so that people see how you're making decisions, how you're evaluating evidence, explaining what's going on, explaining legal rules, providing information about procedures so that people are not confused. We've heard about help desks, that's one example. But basically, people need to see that decisions are being made neutrally. Respect, this is something that's very much of concern to people who have come before authorities, that their concerns are taken seriously, that they're being treated with respect, that their rights are acknowledged. So we need to train everyone involved to try to think about whether they're treating the public with courtesy, with politeness. Now, I've found that, particularly among the police, if you talk about a customer service model, you get lots of very negative looks. And so I would emphasize that I'm not saying that courts are stores. It's not that you're clerks and it's your job to be nice to the customers. But people are entitled to feel that they're being taken seriously, that their complaints, their claims are being taken seriously, that they're being taken seriously. And so it's important to explain to people what their rights are, to acknowledge their rights, and to acknowledge things such as the right to complain. One of the interesting findings that I've seen from research is if you tell people that they have the right to complain and you make it easy for them to do that, like give them a letter, here's how to complain, people usually don't complain. They're very comfortable with the idea that they have the right to complain and that they know how to do it, and that seems to eliminate a lot of the anxiety that might actually lead someone to complain.
And finally, trust. What do people really care about when they deal with an authority? They want to believe that that authority is sincere and caring, that that authority is trying to listen to them, trying to understand the issues, trying to do what's right for the people involved in the situation, and acting in the interests of the parties, not their own interests. And again, this is probably often true, but how can people be made to see that? What we need to do is we need to communicate to people that they have been listened to. Obviously, giving them a chance to speak is important to showing them they're being listened to, but also acknowledging what they say so that they know that they have been listened to and acknowledging that you considered what they said when you made a decision, even if you didn't do what they asked. People constantly report frustration over things like I'm telling my story and the judge is signing papers, which seem to them to suggest that the judge is not considering what they're saying, not taking it seriously. They get upset when they feel that five seconds after the trial seems to be over, the judge issues a decision, seeming to have not considered the case very seriously. Decision makers can communicate their motivations by explaining how they've considered arguments, why they're making the decision that they're making, and obviously, if necessary, explaining how they're following rules. I think that the point of all of this and the redesign that might go along these lines is that we gain these, I, these objectives that I mentioned. We gain decision acceptance that's maintained over time. We diminish anger and defiance. We create legitimacy. And obviously, again, I don't think I have to say to the people in this room, many of the kinds of courts that you already work in reflect these different ideas. I think that this is a body of research that supports what you're doing, argues that what you're doing is important, argues that it should be more central to the design of the courts. And I'm pleased to say that California has already taken this one step further. They have already made procedural fairness one of the centerpieces of court design. They have a five-year plan. They have these wonderful books that they've put together. And it's a general idea of a seamless system where at every level, everyone you deal with is concerned about being fair, enacting procedural fairness. So you have this experience throughout dealing with the courts. It's been said, David Weisberg said, although I think he was talking about research funding, I think it's also true of court funding. We don't have any money. Every group I talk to, they, I'm always told before I talk, we don't have any money. So don't propose anything that costs anything because we can't afford it. And what I would say is interesting about this time we're in now is these are the kinds of changes that can be made in a system that doesn't have much money. And in fact, they free up money. If you increase decision acceptance, people don't come back so much, you have extra resources. If people are not as upset and they're not taxing the staff, you have extra resources created. Now, I would like to say that from my point of view, I think that these changes should be enacted because I think they make for a better court system. I think a court system that's responsive to the public is doing a better job of delivering justice, but I'm not ashamed to make the argument that this might be a particularly useful kind of change to make when we're in an era of austerity. So we do live in an era of scarce resources, and this is the kind of initiative that can address a lot of the concerns in the court system without calling upon the government for massive allocations of resources. It's something that we can do just because we decide it's the right thing to do. Thank you.